Well, good morning. We are so thrilled to have you this morning at Hinsdale Philham Seventh-day Adventist Church. Um, you may also be here for our No More, no More Fear series. Maybe you've gotten a flyer or a poster or a text or an invite or a mailer uh, to come for our second session today of our beautiful series over the next three weekends 
on how to live without fear. This first song that we'll sing together, I'm going to invite you to rise with us as we sing our opening song, Because He Lives. It says we can face tomorrow. All fear is gone because Jesus lives. He's not just someone in the Word that we read from so long ago. He lives and all fear can be gone. So rise with us. This is a dear song to many of us. If it's the first time you've heard it, you can read along in the screen behind me. Um, hum along and learn it with us. Because He lives. is to find someone new this morning, maybe someone you haven't met or an unfamiliar face, and greet them, welcome them into the house of God this morning.
Good morning and happy Sabbath. I am so glad to see everyone, each and every one of you here this morning. And it's a special Sabbath. Every Sabbath is a special Sabbath. The sun is shining. It got a little warmer. And we are here worshiping the Lord Jesus Christ. So I thank you for joining us. Thank you, live stream, for wherever you are joining us here in this moment to, um, to worship the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Well, I want to share with you just a few announcements of what's going on in our church. Number one, uh, I want to share you a few things of what's happening in the youth. There is an international food fair coming up. This is to help promote and help fundraise for Hinzel Philem and a joint effort with Hinzel Church. So join us for an international food fair. We're going to have food from all over the con all over the world, and every proceeds will help bring our pathfinders to not Oshkosh anymore, but to Gillette, Wyoming for the International Camporee. So join us. It's going to be a great, wonderful experience. The second event I have for the youth is that there is going to be a Friendsgiving brunch happening November 12. So this is all for middle school and high school. Let's come together. Let's enjoy the time that we have as friends. And let's just say thank you to each other and to God. So join us on Sunday, November 12, starting at 1030 a.m. This is for both middle school and high school. And there's no slide for this, but I'm calling all young adults. There's also going to be a Friendsgiving, November 26. So if you want more information, contact me or uh, Kenrick for more information on all that's going to be for the young adults. So that's going to be November 26, um, Friendsgiving for the young adults. Now, this starting last night, we have started a great teaching series. It's all about learning how to have no more fear. And the Pastor Nestor showed to us that it's not, we don't have to be worried about the future. We don't have to worry about the destination. All we have to worry about is our connection with Jesus Christ. You know, this world is chaotic. Turn on the news, no positivity. Mostly things, what's happening in the world around us. And let me tell you this, not only what's happening in the world around us, but in our own lives. Life is chaotic. And I think it's so appropriate that we are learning how to have no more fear, that only through Jesus Christ we can have hope for the future and for today, hope and no more fear of guilt and shame. So I want to let you know, if any of you have need any translation for our service today, there is transmitters where there will be someone to translate Spanish for you. So if you need any Spanish translation, feel free to go back to the foyer and we will give you a, a machine a device for you to be able to hear it in Spanish. Well, I'm so excited that you are here this morning. God's going to bless us tremendously this morning as we seek our eyes towards Jesus. I want to call up the praise team again, and they're all going to sing our theme song for this whole series, My Life is in Your Hands. invite you to sing our theme song with us by session eight you'll know it by heart what beautiful words that our lives are all in God's hands Just live. 
Let's kneel together in prayer this morning. Father God, this morning we come to you, Lord, on bended knee, just celebrating you, our Father. Lord, we know the world is full of chaos. There's a lot of fear out there because of everything going on around us, whether it's abroad or even right here at home. But yet we know, Lord, that you are ultimately in control and that we don't have to fear, that we don't have to worry because our life is in your hands. Our salvation is assured in you, Lord. And so this morning we come before you with hearts filled with humility, with hearts filled with thanksgiving. And we just say thank you. Lord, we do want to lift up those around the world that are struggling right now. Lord, the, there's a war raging in multiple areas and there's unnecessary death and dying. And so we just lift all those families up to you right now that are struggling, that have lost someone. Lord, we can't make sense of these things at times, but we just leave them in your hands. Lord, we pray for some of our members who are ill this week. Some are still battling with sickness. Some are, are hospitalized. Some are stuck at home, Lord, wherever they are. We pray a special blessing and healing on them. You will just come upon them right now that you will comfort them, Lord. If they're in pain, Lord, that we pray that you will relieve it. But here we are this morning, Lord, in your presence, waiting to hear a word from you. And so as we proceed with the message today, I just pray that you will speak through Pastor Nestor, that you will speak through the testimonies and that you will speak directly into our hearts. Lord, we lift up the series that is going on right now, and we just pray, Lord, maybe even online right now, there's somebody tuned in. And we just pray that this message will be perfect for them, much needed for them. And at the end of the day, Lord, our desire is to be with you. And so we look forward, Lord, to that day when you will come in those clouds of glory to take us home. Thank you for the assurance of your return. May we be anticipating it and be ready for you, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, good morning again. Happy Sabbath. You know, as you've noticed, our service is maybe a little truncated with our praise sets um, with the Lamb's Corner because we have a very special guest this morning. Last night, we were able to introduce to you our special guest, which is Sandra Seifert. And Sandra Seifert, um, she's going to share more of her testimony, but she came all the way from the Philipp Philippines, correct? Philippines um, to really share her testimony. She has a great testimony. And what we are going to do today is allow it to her testimony to share the goodness of God. So I'm going to introduce Sandra. Uh, can you come on up here? This is Sandra Seifert. Go ahead and grab a mic. Good morning, um, Pastor Rodney, and of course to everyone. Happy Sabbath. Thank you so much for the warm welcome as early as uh, yesterday. Um, I have fond memories of Chicago, actually. My son, Coco, was born here. And uh, yeah, it's really good to be back. Um, I feel like I have family, you know, at heart here from the faith. Um, so yeah. And I also wanted to know, are there any first timers at the church today? Anyone here for the first time? Oh, our photographer. <laughs> he has a really powerful camera, I see. Welcome. 
Uh, anyone else who's um, perhaps not Seventh-day Adventist, but here today? Oh, it looks like we have a lot of brothers and sisters with us today. So, Sandra, you know, this is not our first time meeting. Actually, when we, I heard that you'd be coming, I was, I was happy because, you know, back then when I was in California, we met in Central Filipino Church. So you have gone through different churches sharing your testimony. What's your story, and what compels you to go to, um, to different churches um, sharing um, your life? Yeah, so I was actually um, traveling all the way from the Philippines to the U.S. Um, this is my third time to visit the States. Um, God has brought me here. I always wonder, um, Pastor Ronnie, why, why me? You know, there's so many great preachers in the U.S. of A. But um, yeah, God has worked beautifully in my life. And uh, I decided, um, you know, through much prayer to take on the, the calling to serve him again and share this story. Um, I'll try to be as um, concise as I can be because the full testimony at churches that I give, which comes with visuals, is usually around 35 to 40 minutes. But um, for the sake of our um, program today, um, I'll condense it. But essentially, a lot of people ask me if I actually was born Adventist, and the, the answer to that is no. I was born to Catholic parents in a Seventh-day Adventist hospital in Taipei, Taiwan. So that's kind of the backstory. And then growing up, um, in retrospect, I believe that God used Seventh-day Adventist families as we were, yeah, you know, growing um, in the Philippines mainly uh, to plant seeds in our hearts um, and also in that of my mom because we had really good experiences with Seventh-day Adventists. They were always very welcoming, um, very health-oriented. I just noticed this pattern and very kind, very hospitable. But it wasn't until the age of 16, for me at least, that I had my very first, I call it gripping Bible study. And this was actually in the Philippines. I was modeling at the time and there was this uh, designer that I had worked for, modeled for, and uh, he invited me and my mother to attend a Bible study that he was hosting in his boutique. So. In a way, God worked through fashion to, um, you know, knock on my heart that time. And um, we were very open. We said, sure, we'll attend a Bible study. And lo and behold, it changed my life completely. Because during that series, I learned so many important things that blew me away. And I want to narrow it down to three pillars of truth, I call them, that really, you know, sold me on the fact that the truth is within Seventh-day Adventism, the quality of truth that I searched for and that I was able to verify thus far. So the first pillar of truth, I call it, is the truth about um, health. Like Seventh-day Adventists, they have what is called a health message, um, and that is based on the fact that the Bible presents us with health principles. God says um, that he desires for us to prosper in health. That was his original design for us. He never wanted us to suffer from any form of diseases. And also in 1 Corinthians chapter 9 verses or chapter 6 verses 19 to 22, um, it says there that our bodies are a temple bought with a price, right? So this is a gift, this body that we, um, that we own, and we need to take care of gifts. We don't just want to abuse it and do whatever. And... Um, I also realized in that study that God really has a special guideline or diet for his people. Even in the Garden of Eden, you'll see, like, you know, God really wanted us to essentially go plant-based, right? He knew that that would suffice for us um, to nourish ourselves. But then, of course, you, you have what is called history, um, the flood, and then, and then later on you see again in the journey of um, Moses how he... Um, led, uh, you know, the, his people out of Egypt, you see that um, God again provided a very specific diet for his people in the wilderness, which was manna, right? So you just, over time and with careful study and prayer, realize that God always desired for us to prosper in health. And so for me, that was something I had never known before, and I was pretty much just eating whatever I thought was delicious um, until the age of 16. So that's the first thing that really convinced me that this is, this is important and this is true. The next um, pillar of truth was the truth about the Sabbath. Because, um, you know, growing up in the Philippines, it's a very um, 
Catholic um, dominant country. Uh, so I was just used to people going to church on Sunday. And, you know, even if I had known those Seventh-day Adventist families that planted seeds in our hearts, they never like pushed the Sabbath upon us, which I thought was really nice. They were really just being themselves. But I then realized, oh, Sunday is not the true day of worship. Um, because we were studying this in, in the Bible study, right? So I asked, which day did Jesus keep? And then um, we found out, um, based on the scripture, that Jesus kept the Sabbath. So which day is the Sabbath, right? And then with more study and research, we find out that the original seven-day Sabbath is actually Saturday, right? Um, but why does everyone keep Sunday? Or like the whole world seems to be Sunday-oriented when it comes to rest, so I did my own study, and I discovered that back in AD 538, I believe, there was this emperor named Constantine, and he actually moved the Sabbath from Saturday to Sunday to advance his own political agenda. And that basically was adapted as a tradition and carried on until our present day. So um, in a way, I felt deceived and really you know, heavy at heart. And I wanted to share this information with more people, especially at the age of 16. I was like, wait a minute, if I know this, why don't other people know this? They need to know this. But I was just a student back then in high school. So I prayed and I said, Lord, can you give me an opportunity to share this information? Because this is really important. People need to know the true day of, of worship is uh, a Sabbath. You know, that's what Jesus kept when he was here on earth. And God presented me with an opportunity. So... I was in my final year of high school, and we had to submit a thesis worth 3,500 words, and it could be on any subject matter, any topic. So I, I realized that was my chance. So you know what I, I wrote my thesis on? This is my topic, Sabbath versus Sunday, which is the true day of worship? So from the title alone, you can already tell, wait, Sabbath is not Sunday, right? So... That was my, my topic. And, um, of course, I did all my uh, research, all my due diligence, I submitted all my empirical evidence, um, which was required to prove that Sabbath is a true day of worship. And um, here's, the, here's the catch. The person or professor who graded my, um, my thesis was actually a Catholic reverend. So it was going to be an interesting situation. But I did my part. And you know, when, when you advocate for the truth and you stand firm um, and you can defend it, God will also back you up. So um, did I pass or did I fail? Of course I passed. God is good. And I also did my part. So, <laughs> But it's interesting because ever since that moment that I submitted my paper and I, I had this Catholic reverend grade it, Every time I would see him in the hallways on campus, after that moment, he would always be like, mm-hmm, <laughs> you know, so I'm hoping we planted a seed there, even just to one soul, you know. But yeah, that was the second pillar of truth, like the, the true day of worship being Sabbath, because I really thought it was Sunday up until that point. And then the third one was just the beauty of prophecies and how the Bible actually interprets itself. You do not need a third person who could be biased or subjective to um, teach you the Bible. If you study it diligently with God's help, you'll see that the Bible can unlock itself, that for instance, the books of Daniel and Revelation go really hand in hand, you know, uh, when it comes to prophecy. Or you'll start to realize that a woman the term woman in the, in the Bible could be both literal or symbolical for a church, right? Christ will return for his bride. So churches can also represent, um, be represented by the term women. So, um, yeah, I was just mesmerized. And then, of course, having um, Daniel interpret the dream of the king, you know, with the, with the I don't know how much you, you guys know about prophecy, but um, how, you know, he had this this figure and then different parts of, um, you know, gold, brass, copper, until the clay of feet, um, and how that was all symbolical or representative of different stages in human history. So for me, I was just mind blown when I, when I learned about that. And that pretty much was what I needed um, moving forward to know that this is a true church of the Lord. 
And um, yeah, from that moment onwards, I shifted my diet at 16 to a plant-based diet. And uh, I decided to go to church on Sabbath, Saturdays instead of Sunday. And um, yeah, I tried to practice that until it was time for my next chapter, which was college. So you are young in the faith. Your eyes were open. You found these amazing truths found in Scripture that really compelled you to believe in the Bible. Mm -hmm. And you were baptized at what age? Okay, so good question. Um, I, I basically went to college next, right? And college for me was in the United States. So immediately I looked for a Seventh-day Adventist church here. I actually took up nursing in New York. Anyone from New York here? Oh, yeah. Welcome. That's actually where we're going next, um, after Chicago. Um, so, yeah, uh, I studied nursing in New York, and um, I found a Seventh-day Adventist church um, in Manhattan. So it's on, on the west, in the West Village. And, um, yeah, I basically continued keeping my Sabbath, continued my diet, and then from that Bible study, almost 10 years passed. And in 2008... I was finally, um, you know, approached by the pastor at that church. He told me, listen, Sandra, you're so active at church. You're leading the prayer groups in the afternoons, you know, the prayer meetings. Um, you would be a perfect candidate for baptism. But then I told him, I don't know, pastor. I feel like I need to be perfect before I get baptized. There's so much I need to work on, you know. Um, I, I, I just didn't have a clear understanding of the concept of baptism, I guess. And and so he told me, Sandra, he clarified this for me, um, you know, to get baptized doesn't mean you have to be perfect because every day is, you know, always a journey with the Lord. But essentially what baptism implies is that you want to declare to heaven and to the earth what you believe in and what you stand for. In other words, it's like going official with my relationship with Jesus, right? And I finally understood this concept and uh, yeah, it made sense to me. So I said, let me pray about it. And then I talked to my mom because remember my mom and I, we started that Bible study together and we also started keeping the Sabbath and shifting our diet and whatnot. So after all these years, I told her, mom, I think it's time for me to get baptized. And you know what my mom said? She was like, what? I also want to get baptized. Let's do it together. And then I was like, oh, yeah, sure, that's great news, but make sure you're doing it for the right reasons, not just because I'm getting baptized, you know. You, you know, you want to pray about it too. And she did, and she was still convinced. So she said, we're going to get baptized together. That was in 2008. And her only request was, since I'm the mom, I'm going to get immersed in the water first, okay? <laughs> so, 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 like, you know, respect for the elderly and, like, okay, yes, no problem. So that happened in New York in 2008. The same year, I also graduated from nursing, and it was a big year for me. Um, yeah, brother, uh, it was a big year for me, uh, 2008. Okay, so you, you were baptized into the faith, and you've learned that it's not the end-all, be-all. It's your official Facebook status, I'm in a relationship. <laughs> yes, I'm in exactly. the relationship with Jesus Christ. But things, but opportunities came knocking at your door. Now, you came here, you... Actually, we're in the presence of a celebrity. I don't know if you know that. In the Philippines. So tell me, what, what was the opportunity that came knocking at your door in the Philippines that allowed you to gain no, uh, popularity? You ask really good questions. It like matches <laughs> my journey. No, well, basically after college, right, since I graduated, the next question was, what's next, right? High school done, college done. And so... I was an international student in New York, and I obviously missed my family, so I decided to, to visit them in the Philippines, and pretty much from the moment I landed, I was approached by so many scouts. They were like, oh, she's back, because they remembered me from modeling, right, at the age of 16, um, so I kind of had a following there for my, for my modeling career, but it wasn't until, like, after college, at the age of about 25, that they were like, Man, you should join Miss Philippines. You're ready. Got to hide the look, the education now. So you'd represent us really well. So there I was, approached with all these opportunities to join. And I kind of liked the idea. Um, I also justified with myself, maybe, maybe this is what God wants, because there's so many approaching me to do this. Um, and so I prayed. I was like, Lord, maybe I should join this pageant. 
maybe if I win, I can bring more souls to you with the influence that I'm going to gain, you know? I just kind of wanted him to agree with me also. So I had this conversation and, and I, I liked the idea, you know, because I was also still young, you know, coming from an environment like New York where everyone's so ambitious and hardworking, that, that vibe was still kind of in me, you know? I, I didn't want to, like, stop now. How can I make an impact in this world? How can I, you know, leave, leave footsteps behind? Or Yeah, I, just, I was just young and hungry still to succeed. So um, that um, continued in my prayers and conversations with God. And so I, I decided to join. And guess what? I won. So I even more believed then that it was God's will because I won the crown. And I was like, wow, amazing. So that opened a lot of opportunities for me. So the crown that you got was not Miss Philippines. What, what was it? I, I lo- joined the local pageant first. Okay. So it was actually Miss Earth, the pageant regarding um, environmental advocacies that I joined in. So I joined, it's called Miss Philippines Earth. Um, in the Philippines, like the local one. But then when you win in the local pageant, you represent your country in Miss Earth, right? And so that's what happened. I, I won Miss Philippines Earth, which opened a lot of doors in the Philippines and also gave me the opportunity to represent the Philippines in Miss Earth International. And that's what I did next. And in Miss Earth, I won another crown, which is um, Miss Earth Air. It's like first runner-up because they have four crowns, Miss Earth, Miss Earth Air, Miss Earth Water, and Miss Earth Fire, the elemental um, court, they call it. So that opened opportunities for me at the international level. So not long after, I was pretty much on all these magazine covers. I was um, doing hosting gigs left and right. I was doing fashion shows, and I was um, making contacts and building connections with really influential people. It's nice to share this with the visuals. Maybe if you have time this afternoon, I'll, I'll share more at Glen Ellen Church. But um, yeah, it's, it's really intense, like how I suddenly was brought into this whole nother world, you know, after being a student and getting baptized and just experiencing fame overnight, pretty much. So um, yeah, I got so, so... Um, I always say sucked into the world again. Um, And there was this time that I wanted to keep going. And then I said, what else can I do? You know, I'm doing everything already. And I decided to start a business with another beauty queen. And uh, we we launched a swimwear line because we're from the Philippines. It's a tropical country. And uh, yeah, I was basically doing all these things. But it wasn't until I had to turn over my crown, right? that I, I realized like things were changing. And uh, I know God was very patient with me because I was already with him, right? And I was, um, yeah, just keeping my Sabbath and everything and, uh, you know, changing my lifestyle. Um, but something happened. Uh, there was this Sabbath, um, one Sabbath, and there was this opportunity that was presented to me to do a, a dance number on national TV on Sabbath morning. So, again, I talked to God. I was like, Lord, this is a really good opportunity. It's easy money. They'll pay me cash after. It's, it's on Sabbath morning. No one will know because everyone will be at church. And I can just take the cash and go to church after and pay more tithes and offerings. You know, I was like just justifying how I really want to do this. And, um, well, by now you probably figured me out. Did I do it or not? Oh, wow, you guys have so much faith. Um, I did. <laughs> Sorry to disappoint you. I did do it. Um, and it's just so crazy because I, it really took like 10 minutes to dance number. I got the cash. I went to church. I submitted my tithes and offerings. And um, I thought I could get away with it. But two weeks later, it backfired at me. You know, the truth, the truth will always surface no matter how much you try to hide it, right? So what happened was, I came across one of, one of the brothers at church, and he comes to me and he goes, Sister Sandra, is it true that you danced on national television on Sabbath morning? We always say in, in Philippines or in Tagalog, patay, you know? Um, so here comes me, all um, like, kind of like Adam and Eve, very human, 
trying to point a finger at someone else. It was a serpent. It was Eve. You know, you never want to take the blame right away if we can. Um, and I was like, how do you know that I did that? Do you watch TV on Sabbath morning? <laughs> <laughs> so... We both kind of laughed about it, um, but of course, anything that goes on national TV or social media, you know, it's bound to, to, to surface. And so I, I believe that it was God's gentle way of kind of knocking on my heart and telling me, my dear daughter, there are six other days and many different ways to earn money. You know, you don't have to sacrifice that one day that I ask of you. Yeah. So we just, to, okay, so let's take a step back. So we learned that you have... You found truth in scripture, and your eyes were in line, and you felt God's goodness. But then, not, opportunities started knocking at your door. You won Miss Earth, Air, and then you started getting more gigs and opportunities because you got a crown. Mm -hmm. And so now you're left with this realization, I, I'm getting all this fame, I'm getting all this popularity, I have this business venture that is, that is going well, but then came a, p opportun uh, a point in your life where now your faith and your opportunity intersected. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You found out that this opportunity was leading all eyes, not on God, but to yourself. And so you felt that guilt. And you started feeling that shame because people are looking at you like, Sandra, you were dancing on Sabbath. I don't know how he knew. I don't know if YouTube, I don't know if YouTube was popular or if things were recorded back then, but they found out. And, you know, like you said, you started blaming. Maybe well, you're not supposed to do that. And, you know, you started realizing, you know, I'm feeling a little guilty because I tried justifying my own actions. So I want to sit on that. How did, you, how did you respond? Once you felt that guilt and shame from people pointing at you saying, hey, look, you, were, you, are, you follow the Sabbath, you keep the health laws, you learn about prophecies, you are baptized in this believer as Sunday Adventist church, but you're not acting like that. That's how they see it. How did you respond to that guilt and shame? Well, definitely it made me feel uneasy. And in retrospect, I'm just really thankful because these kinds of experiences and realizations kind of brought me back to God slowly but surely. I want to just add to that story that aside from that Sabbath situation, it all kind of happened pretty much consequentially that I also had to turn over my crowns, right? First, the local one, which wasn't so hard because I still had the international one, but then eventually I also had to give that one up. And then my business went downhill with my fellow beauty queen. We had like a falling out. So as all these things were happening, I just felt less and less confident. And then also when you turn over a crown, a new woman in this, in, is in the spotlight, right? So she gets all the attention, she gets all the opportunities. And so for someone like me who has been extracting a lot of my confidence and a lot of my value from the gigs and opportunities I was getting and, and the fame and the fortune that I was earning, um, I just felt like my value decreased and so did my confidence and I eventually reached a low point, right? Now, that was a very crucial moment in time and I'm so thankful that things didn't go otherwise because technically, when I was at that low and I was close to depression, I could have easily resorted to, let's say, the wrong crowd from the world and talk this out to alcohol or maybe to drugs even, right? Just to deal with this low in my life. But God is so good and... Um, his Holy Spirit really knocked on my heart and reminded me to go back to Scripture. So I went back to the Bible, and um, I tried to seek comfort in His Word. And of course, what better book to read than the Bible when you're looking for comfort? Amen? That book is full of promises, full of hope and encouragement that you just really cannot help but, you know, get back on track because of God's goodness in there. And so he showed me step by step with specific verses the answers and um, the comfort that I needed at that point in life. And it's beautiful because the Bible tells us that um, more than striving for things on the earth, we should set our affections on things above, you know. And what would it profit a man, or in my case a woman, if she gains the whole world 
but loses her own soul, according to Mark 8.36, I believe. So, and then he took it a bit further where he revealed to me that there is a crown of life, an incorruptible crown, an unperishable crown that awaits everyone, according to 2 Timothy 4, 8. Not just me, but all those that await Jesus' appearing, you know, and are faithful to, till the end. A crown that we don't have to pass on, you know, a crown of life that, that um, is eternal and heavenly. So it really hit me in the heart, um, Brother Rodney, because I was like, you know, I had this tangible earthly crown, but God tells me there's an even better crown than that, you know, and that is the heavenly crown. So from that moment on, you know, my, my interests shifted, you know, and I also found all that comfort and um, God in his word, he does not make me feel guilty and shameful. He really makes me feel special. Psalms um, reveals that we were each fearfully and wonderfully made. There's only one Rodney. There's only one Sandra. There's only one of you, each one of you. And um, God really put a lot of thought into each one of us, gave us each specific talents, specific type of um, beauty, look, etc. cetera. Um, and everyone has a very specific purpose. So with that realization, I felt way more special than like, you know, and lastingly special than what, you know, I felt when I was just a beauty queen for a year. And of course, the ultimate reminder for me at that point became really Jesus' sacrifice on the cross because he, he already proved that he gave up his life for me and for you. Like, what more can I do but really um, thank him and give my life for him somehow? So remember that promise that I made to him that if I win a crown, I'm going to try to bring more people to him? So that at that point, I, I, you know, reconnected with God and I told him, Lord, I want to fulfill that promise to you right now with your help. If you can work with me and use me, whatever influence I still have after turning over the earthly crown, let's work together. I want to share your goodness with people. And God really gave me the opportunity. He gave me um, spaces and places to share my testimony. First in the Philippines, but then he, he's so good because he knows I love to travel. And then eventually internationally, like we'd be going to places like Papua New Guinea, to um, uh, the Emirates, like Dubai, then to Italy, and then now the United States for the third time. You know, and everything, everything that I previously experienced during my earthly journey to the crown, um, he kind of paralleled that by also giving me a chance to be on magazine covers, a chance to, you know, speak to different audiences, a chance to launch um, another fashion brand, but this time advocating for modest clothing, and also meeting a lot of prominent people, but people who love and serve God. So there's strong parallelism. It's really nice when you see it visually, but I'm trying my best to describe it to you, how God works in really great ways. So I thought my will and my ways were awesome, and, and it was a great, you know, plan for me, but God had a way better plan. That's why what you read in Isaiah about his ways being higher than ours is so true, and I really for, experienced it firsthand. So thank you so much for sharing and being vulnerable with, you know, how you felt in that moment. It was, it could be so easy to pivot into in a, a way to self-medicate that how the world medicates and how they've tried to find value and how they try to figure out how to deal with this guilt and shame that as everyone in this world, it real, helps us realize that we are all sinners. We're all broken. And so I love your testimony that in that moment of feeling guilt and shame, you did not sit on that and hide and cower and like Adam and Eve did. But instead... You resorted to go to Christ. And I want to share with, um, as we start to wrap up, um, some verses that share, tell us exactly what we need to hear. Ephesians 4, verse 2, verse 4 and 5. But God, who is rich in mercy, out of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead through our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved. Lamentations 3, verse 22 and 23, the steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is 
your faithfulness. If only if we come to the realization, this is the reason why we always fail, because we're not realizing that what we read in Scripture is truly real and effective for us today, that we are loved by a great Father. We are loved by one who does not make us feel guilt or shame, but continues to shower his goodness and love and mercy to us. That God is offering something better, not just a crown that will fade away. As you mentioned, after that year, on comes another model who, who, who is able to promote the next, the next year, who has the next fame, the next opportunity, and it's temporary. But with God, he gives us something so much better that's everlasting. So I want to give, give a hand to God for your, your testimony and sharing and being willing to allow yourself to open up. And I just wanted to add to what you just uh, mentioned, which is so beautiful, that, you know, guilt and shame is always a choice. I mean, of course, we want to do our best in this life, right? But there will come moments where we might fall short or we might, you know, make a mistake or something might happen and we truly regret it. But I, I always try to emphasize that, you know, we, we have an option. God is there and he doesn't want us to go anywhere else but to him. And he's ready to mercifully forgive us, especially if we're willing to repent and improve. So just go to God and know that you have a choice and you know that you don't have to rest in this guilt and this shame and this fear and all of that. But, you know, you can trust in his promises. You can trust in his word. And he's really, really going to work ways and wonders and miracles in your life if you allow him to. So choose, choose God always. And yeah, like I know there's so much more we could discuss, but due to time, time frame right now, um, I just want to make sure that you always stay encouraged, no matter how hard life may be or how much war and, and turbulence goes around in the news today. We have this hope and we have this comfort because we have a God that has provided that for us and he will never leave us nor forsake us. Thank you. So Pastor Nestor is going to come up and we're going to learn more about what it means that through God, he offers us something better. Thank you. sounds so sweet. Sandra, thank you so much for sharing your story. When you were in that midst of fear, guilt, and shame, what stuck out to me about your story is that you went to Scripture to find sweetness. You went to Scripture to find sweetness. And I don't know where you are on your journey. We have those of you watching online. She shared a lot about her story. And let me, let me just share with you, at least within this community of faith, the Seventh-day Adventist denomination, which is one of over 40,000 denominations, there are three things that we love, and these are really three things that I really believe. Uh, I want whatever I believe in to be based upon three S's. The Savior, Scripture, and sweetness. Is Jesus, Jesus, what does Jesus have to say? I listen to my Savior, and I go to the Scripture to find out what the Savior says, and I go here to find sweetness. And that's what, we, that's what we find. We find sweetness in him. And there was another woman in this amazing book, uh, the Gospel of John. She was a woman from this town of Samaria who also found sweetness. And this morning, the few moments that we have, I'd like to share with you a few, a few words about this amazing story in John chapter 4. Jesus is traveling with his disciples. And he says, guys, we need, we, need to, we need to leave. We need to go back to Galilee. We need to leave Judea, go back to Galilee. But we need to stop by a place called Samaria. And while Jesus was in Samaria, he met a woman. 
And in John chapter 4, verse 7, let me read these verses with you. John chapter 4, verse 7 says, A woman from Samaria came to draw water. Jesus said to her, Give me a drink. For his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. And the Samaritan woman said to him, The Samaritan woman said to him, How is it that you, a Jew, ask for a drink from me, a woman of Samaria? For Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. See, the Jewish people and the Samaritans, they did not get along. They hated each other. I remember when I was uh, pastoring in Wisconsin, and I would bring up the Chicago Bears, the Packers fans did not like me. (laughs) Packers fans and Chicago Bears fans did not get along. Samaritans and Jews did not get along. Why was this Jew asking this woman, a Samaritan woman, for water? Well, the the text continues, Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that is saying to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. The woman said in verse 11, Sir, you have nothing to draw water with and the water is deep. Where do you get that living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob? He gave us the well and drank from it himself, as did his sons and his livestock. And notice what Jesus says in verse 13. He says this, Everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks of the water that I will give him will never be thirsty again. The water that I will give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. What he's saying to the woman is, the water that you're drinking, you think it's sweet? Wait till you drink the water that I have to give you. You tried mango juice or a mango smoothie? Any of you like boba? Every time I go to Joe Yi, I always get avocado boba, right? Avocado boba. I love it. Any avocado boba fans here? Right? My Spanish, some of my Spanish friends are like, That's, that is a, a curse. We don't take avocados and make it sweet, right? But in Asian culture, especially in Filipino culture, we like it sweet. You think that's sweet? Avocado boba or mango boba or whatever you get, right? Brown sugar boba, whatever, whatever you get. Wait till you taste the sweetness of the living water. Wait till you taste the sweetness of the living water. And that's exactly what he says to this woman. I love one writer who says, He who seeks to quench his thirst at the fountains of this world will drink only to thirst again. Everywhere, men are unsatisfied. They long for something to supply the need of the soul, and only one can meet that want, the need of the world. The desire of all nations is Christ. So, Nestor, you're saying that only Jesus satisfies. He's saying that in the text. So what does that look like? Follow me here. You might not have seen this before. Now in verse 15. Jesus said to her, okay? Now the woman says in verse 15. The woman said, look, all right, you've intrigued me. Sir, give me this water so that I will not be thirsty or have to come here to draw water. All right, you're talking about the sweet water? Give me that. I want that water. I've been working here all my, I'm so tired here. Drawing water in the, under, the, under this cover in, in the middle of nowhere on a hot day. I want that living water. And look what Jesus says in verse 16. Jesus said to her, this is probably not the most tactful thing to say, but he says, go call your husband and come here. The woman answered him, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, you are right in saying I have no husband. For you have had five husbands, and the one you now have is not your husband. What you have said is true. Uh, Jesus, what are you doing? This is not the way that we should witness and tell people about our faith. Go call your husband. Jesus says to the Samaritan woman, I'm glad that you want this living water, but you need to stop drinking stale water. These men in your life who you think are satisfying you, they're not satisfying you. And what Jesus does is he tactfully confronts the Samaritan woman and exposes her emptiness. Jesus pulls a flashlight, you know, on a phone, you could put the flashlight on. He pulls out a flashlight to point out the darkness in her heart, but pay close attention to how she reacts. Let's, let's see how she receives it. The text says in verse 19, as she's feeling the guilt and shame of what he just said, she says, Sir, I perceive that you are a prophet, and our fathers worshipped on this mountain, but you say that in Jerusalem and the place where people are where people ought to worship. There was this controversy of where they should worship. Should the Samaritans worshipped on Mount Gerasim. The Jewish people worshipped on, on, on Jerusalem. And so what is she doing? She, she feels the, the shame and the guilt from that flashlight, 
And what she does is she, she, she deflects. One writer says this, she could deny nothing, but she tried to evade all mention. What word did I say? Evade. Come on, when you put a flashlight on a cockroach, what does it do? It evades. And that's exactly what she was, trying, she was doing. And that this book, The Desire of Ages, continues with deep reverence. She said, sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. Then hoping to silence conviction, she turned to points of religious controversy. The Samaritan, using, uh, the Samaritan woman is using religious controversy to avoid inspection. She uses external ideas to avoid internal work. And look, when someone touches a sensitive area, right, something that we don't really want to talk about, like that shameful thing that we have done or that the, guilt, the thing that we feel are really guilty for, what do we do when someone touches a sensitive area? We usually evade. My feet were hurting and my, one of my children accidentally stepped on my foot. I evaded because it's sensitive. And why does the Samaritan woman avoid Christ's inspection? Why is, the, is she scared of being exposed? You know why? Because she's fearful of guilt and shame. She's fearful of that. Perhaps she doesn't want to get caught. Perhaps she doesn't want to be really known to the deepest part of her soul. Perhaps she fears that if people really knew who she was, that they won't really like her. She might lose her friends. She might lose her influence. She might not have the same followers on Instagram or on Facebook. Perhaps she feels she wants to protect her good image. All right? Perhaps she wants to pretend that she's better than she really is. And friends, we are, we are very good at doing that. I am very good at doing that. She wants to tell people or pers- let people know that she's not really that bad. And we can surmise many reasons for her, ev- her evasion. But I think this one is the most probable that she never really had a real and lasting relationship before. Because you see, she had five husbands, she had five men in her life, and the last one was not her husband. This is exactly what I believe that Jesus is trying to tell her. The Samaritan woman doesn't want to go deep, but what she does is she comes back to surface with a religious controversy. Jesus takes this surface issue, and then he finds an opportunity to give her some sweetness and to give her some grace. And notice what Jesus says in these verses in verse 21. Jesus said to her, woman, believe me, the hour is coming when neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know, for salvation is from the Jews. But the hour is coming and is now here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking such people to worship Him. God is spirit, and those, and, uh, God is spirit, and those who worship Him must worship in spirit and in truth. And then the woman said to Him, okay, 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 I hear what you're saying, I hear what you're saying. And then she says, I know that Messiah is coming, He who is called Christ. When He comes, He will tell us all things. And Jesus says these words, I who speak to you am He. That's me. What is Jesus saying, friends? Their problem is not, he's saying, to the, the, he's saying to the Samaritan woman, the problem is not the place where you worship. Listen to me, Samaritan woman, please. I'm trying to give you some living water, and I'm trying to show you that the waters that you're drinking from are stale. The problem is not the place of worship, woman. The real problem is not the place of worship. The problem is the object of your worship. You are not worshiping in spirit and truth. You are not worshiping God. You are actually worshiping and adoring men. But now, Samaritan woman, you have the opportunity to be adored and to adore and be adored by a man who will satisfy the deepest longings of your heart. Who is this man, you might wonder? And looks right at the woman and says, I'm that man. I'm that man. So where does true, lasting joy come from, friends? The only place that we can find eternal joy is an, in an intimate relationship with Jesus. It's the only place. That's the only place where we can find this joy, which will then rid us of guilt and shame. So what does this look like? What does this look like? I'm going to draw something here on the flip chart pretty soon. But I want, you to show, I want to show you the reaction of this woman. 
okay? Remember, Jesus called her out. He, look what happens in verses 28 and 29. So the woman left her water jar and went away into town and said to the people, come see a man who told me all that I ever did. This man called me out. Can this be the Christ? Verse 30, they went out of the town and were coming to him. The Samaritan woman is shocked by Christ's words. She sprints to the city and she tells everyone about this man. What was the one thing, friends, what was the one thing the Samaritan woman shares with everyone in town? She says, come see a man who told me all things that I ever th did. And why is this so monumental? What is so significant about the reality that Jesus knows everything about you and me? Even the, the stuff that we've, the guilt and shame that we feel for the stuff that we did this week that we're really guilty and feel ashamed for. Why is that so significant that Jesus knows everything about you? And why is it that the Samaritan woman is so thrilled about this news? Because she can finally be in a relationship where she can safely be herself. For her whole life, her whole life, she was trying to find intimacy, okay? And the only way that we can have and she can have intimacy, there has to be two things. Number one, vulnerability, that I can be open and be myself. And number two, in order to have intimacy, not only do you need to have vulnerability, you also need what we call, can you guys read my handwriting here? I know, I have better handwriting. In order for any intimate relationship to work, there has to be vulnerability and safety. Vulnerability and safety. She was trying to find intimacy with all of these men in her life. She tried to be all vulnerable, but she wasn't safe. Jesus calls her out and makes her feel very vulnerable, ashamed. She feels the guilt. She feels shame for what she did. But not once, not once did Jesus shame her for her wrongdoing. He gave her everything that she was looking for, which was what? A safe place to be herself even in her brokenness. This is what she was looking for. This is what she was looking for. <laughs> Let me relate it this way. My wife, Catherine, and I, we have, we're close. We have intimacy. I dropped the ball, and there are many times where I feel very vulnerable. Like, okay, yeah, I didn't. I said I was going to do that. I didn't do that. But you know what's amazing? I can go back home, and yeah, we have to have tough conversations sometimes about the, the times when I dropped the ball. But I know that I always have a safe place at home because my wife doesn't love me based on my actions. I mean, actions are important. She loves Nestor. She accepts me the way that I am. And I am 110% convinced, friends. I am 110% convinced that the only way that for you and I, for all of us, to experience no more fear of guilt and shame is to find a place, a safe place, where we can go with that guilt and shame. And the, same, the safe place where you can be yourself and you can have a God who loves you unconditionally even when you are in your brokenness and as you continue to, to, to stumble and fall, the only place you can find that is in the Messiah and in Jesus. That's the only place. The only place. Look, guilt and shame is a real thing. The guilt and shame is a real thing. But you know what's amazing about Jesus? That he allows me to be vulnerable and he doesn't condemn me. In fact, the guilt and shame that you felt this week and that I felt this week, uh, felt this week for some wrongdoing that we've done was because I have done something wrong. Because I have messed up and I have dropped the ball. And then just Jesus stand over us and say, uh -huh, I got you, Nestor, shame on you. No. He says, you're drinking stale water. Let me give you a better option. Why don't you take a drink of me? That's how he treats me. 
And in those moments where you feel vulnerable, the only place that you can find release from that shame and guilt, the best place, is in the safe arms of Jesus, who says, hey, you who, have drink, who are drinking stale water, it's okay. Taste me and see that I'm good. And trust me, when you taste that forgiveness and that sweetness, you're going to go to every village and to the ends of the earth to tell people about that grace. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. Was blind, but now I see. So this vulnerability thing, like how, how can I even do that? How can I have a close relationship with this Christ? I feel vulnerable at times for the times I have dropped the ball and I've messed up. I don't feel safe. I want to, but I don't. Is there anyone in Scripture who exemplified vulnerability and safety? Was there anyone in Scripture who exemplified vulnerability? Let me read to you a text here. Philippians chapter 2, verses 7 and 8. Last two verses. Jesus, who did I say? Jesus emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. How do we come to that place of even being vulnerable with God? I mean, I understand he's safe, but I don't even want to be vulnerable with him. We realize that Jesus became the most vulnerable for us. Do you know how criminals were died on the cross on, 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 um, when they were crucified? Yes, they were the hands and their, nail, their, their feet were nailed to a cross. Out of respect for the Messiah, people draw a loincloth or clothing around him. Criminals that died on the cross died completely naked. Jesus, he who knew no sin but became sin for us, became, he took our shame and our guilt and our nakedness complete, literally. He who was the creator of the universe and who created you in your mother's womb was the one who became vulnerable by becoming like me and dying on a cross without any clothes. And as I behold him and I look to him, I don't know about you. I don't see someone who's there to condemn me. I see my Savior that the Scripture talks about, and I taste sweetness. And as the praise team comes up here, I want to I wanna ask you a, a question, friend. Those of you watching online, uh, have you tasted sweetness this week? Have you tasted sweetness this week? Have I tasted sweetness this week? We can taste that sweetness, that sweetness of safety that God offers me, where I can be truly myself, a God who will forgive me. 1 Corinthians 1.9, 1 uh, John 1.9 says, uh, if we confess our sins, He, speaking about Jesus, is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from some of our unrighteousness. Is that what the text says? It says all of our unrighteousness. Though our cloth might be stained, our clothes might be stained, we can come to a Savior that accepts us that we, as we are, as broken as we are, as vulnerable as we are, but at the same time have a space, a safe space to experience his, his, uh, the refreshing waterfall of His forgiveness. Friend, the opportunity is there. And if God is speaking to your heart, I want to invite you. We have a connect card in the pew in front of you. We even have it online. You can scan the QR code. Uh, you can even... Pull up, put it, uh, fill, fill out that, uh, go on that website and fill out our connect card. We want to know. If you want to take that next step, if you want to follow Sa what, what Sandra did, powerful testimony, thank you so much for sharing that, of just taking a step with the Savior and experiencing that sweetness. Let us know as a pastoral team. I want to begin a relationship with Jesus. I want to join a Bible study group. I want to be baptized. Let us know as, as a pastoral team on the card. You can submit this on the way out as we t collect our tithes and offerings. We can even submit it online and we'll get in touch with you as a pastoral team. But could it be that amazing grace, that the grace of Jesus is sweeter than we think it is? I think so. Let's stand together. 
we're going to sing Amazing Grace, How Sweet the Sound. And we're going to sing it from hearts that are tasting the sweetness of Jesus today. So let's sing together. Praise team for leading us in that song. 
Before we pray, I'd like to invite several people up. I'd like to invite the Joe, fa- the Low family, not the Joe family, the Low family. All right, please come on up, and also Sandra, please come up, come up as well. We'd like to um, thank these people uh, for several reasons. One, we have a tradition here when people become new members. Come on, come on this way. We'll have the Low family stand right here, and then Sandra right next to them. Don't be shy. I don't bite. Okay. We have a tradition here uh, when we welcome new uh, family members. They've already been family, but this is official. Uh, we have a, a tradition to give them a gift and to let them know that they're loved. Can I see a raise of hands of those who, of you who would like to accept this lovely family into our church fellowship? Wonderful. Let's give a round of applause to God for bringing this special family to us. You guys are awesome, great people. We're so glad that you're a part of this. Sandra, thank you, thank you, thank you for blessing us. Uh, we, I, we have a mutual friend, Michael Tuasan from California, and so it's just amazing uh, to hear your story. We have a gift for both of you, okay? So um, welcome. We are blessed to, to have you here. We're blessed by your presence. We're blessed by your ministry. And in, in, case, uh, in case you don't know, um, the Hinsdale family, the Hinsdale Philam Church loves you. Just remember that. Remember that. And don't be shy. On our way out, they're going to stand next to me. So make sure you greet them and give them a, a welcome and a thank you for their presence and their service today. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you so much that you will do whatever it, th- it takes to come into intimate relationship with us. And you will come And even in my brokenness and in my sin and in our struggle and in that guilt and shame that we experience, you give us a safe place where you say, Nestor, my friend, I do not condemn you. Experience and taste my sweetness. Taste my forgiveness. Taste my love. Taste me. Which then works in our lives and causes us to change and turn away from selfishness and sin and embrace everything about you. How could the Samaritan woman want anything else when she found Jesus? And so thank you, Lord. And thank you for my friends here who are here. We pray a special blessing upon them in their ministry in this local church and the ministry around this country and around the world. We love you. We give glory to the name of Jesus. In Jesus' name, let all of God's people say amen. Amen. You may be seated. Just a reminder, tonight, 6.30, we continue our No More Fear series. It's entitled... No more fear of division and disunity. And tomorrow night at 6.30, no more fear of moral failure. Thank you for coming tonight. Bring a friend. Take one of these flyers. We have hundreds of them. And if you're looking for a place to eat, there's no better place than our fellowship hall. You're welcome. God bless you. Have a great day. See you tonight. Congrats, guys.